Hi there. Um, this is a hastily done presentation because I only heard I was doing this recently, <laughs> but I'm happy to talk about this topic because um, OSPOs are near and dear to my heart. You'll learn more about that in a minute. Um, it's a growing trend, although those of us in the tech world have known about them for a long time. And um, so let's begin. If you have questions, please put them in the chat and we will have a Q&A at the end. So if I say anything that bothers, you know, let me know. All right, here we go. So first of all, here's a little timeline to get us started. Um, <clears throat> you'll notice, and this is not to scale time-wise, you know, where the actual things land, because the Free Software Foundation was, of course, years ahead of the rest of us in recognizing the opportunity of uh, what we now call open source. Back then, it was called free software exclusively, and uh, there was reasons for that. But in 1998, the term open source was coined uh, by some folks at a meeting that was convened by O'Reilly and uh, O'Reilly Publishing. And O'Reilly also published a book that was essays by the prominent players in the free software movement. The reason they sought a change of name was, of course, because free is an ambiguous term in English. It means both gratis and, and free as in freedom. And uh, that free as in freedom is kind of what Richard Stallman meant, but uh, there was confusion and it was causing some problems in the business community, which Tim O'Reilly noticed and others had noticed as well. In 1998 also, Mozilla was the first corporation to ever create an open source project um, volitionally, you know, as a strategy. And they, of course, had a group that got together to talk about building that license and the terms under which they would work. And that could be considered um, the first the first office around an open source thing in corporation. Um, however, <laughs> Linux had been going for a while and there were several sort of Linux clubs inside of the leading tech corporations. And I know because I was in one at Apple in the early 90s, you know, not too long after Linux was founded. And I know B. Dale Garvey was already um, puttering around with it at, at HP. But I, I actually believe I started the first corporate OSPO or the first OSPO. And the reason that we called it an OSPO, which stands for Open Source Program Office, is because Sun was really big on program offices. There were program offices for everything. And so since I was gonna focus on open source, I was hired in, in uh, early 99, we set me up in office and we started talking about it that way. And it, it's an obvious acronym. I don't think it was particularly clever, but uh, it seems to have stuck because that is the term that is generally used now. Um, Sun needed an OSPO because they were making a big bet in open source. Now going on through the timeline and by 2000, most of the deep tech, companies already had an OSPO. And that's only a year later, but you know, HP, IBM, Intel, uh, even Microsoft, uh, it was not a very functional OSPO at that point, but they had one. Uh, Novell and Apple, I know for sure had there, I may have missed a few and I'm not trying to be exhaustive here, but the idea is there were a handful and they were mostly, you'll notice, companies that worked in operating systems and particularly around uh, Unix. So what came right after that um, was a gradual expansion that by 2010 seemed to us in the open source world like a landslide. Um, 2010 is when I worked my way out of uh, the working on um, the open source initiative. And so I did that for 10 years. And I, you know, I, I worked at, out of it because I was too busy. At that point, I was the CTO of Wikipedia and that was taking up all my time. But also it looked to me like it was an inevitability that open source was gonna prevail. We'd been through a few rounds of arguing about whether the licensing needed to change, whether open source definition needed to change. But the fact that money was starting to accumulate behind OSPOs was a pretty big deal, right? Um, so then in 2015, open source won in the marketplace, um, as in we stopped having traditional enemies and uh, mostly we stopped having Microsoft as a traditional enemy. That's the year that Satya Nadella became the CEO of Microsoft. That's also the year that Stephen von Nichols uh, wrote his famous paper that basically said open source has won, get over it. Um, 
And then in 2020, we saw the second wave of the rise of the OSPO. And this, I would argue, is a new kind of OSPO. It's a little bit different than the corporate OSPO. Corporate OSPOs are very deeply discussed in places like the To Do Group at the Linux Foundation. But the OSPO++ as a concept is about the institutionality of the existence of OSPOs being helped or being used as a way to help municipalities and academia to join this movement um, in more largely, you know, like MIT has been doing open courseware for a long time, but um, most large research institutions in the world are not that deeply involved. Um, the city of Munich adopted open source and kicked out Microsoft back in 2000, 2001, I think. Uh, and they've gone back and forth as politics have, you know, prevailed. We're pro, we're pro Microsoft, we're not pro Microsoft, we're pro Microsoft again. Um, and we'll talk about that some more, but a broad stroke like the European Union in 2020, um, revealing that they were going to recommend uh, that there be OSPOs all throughout the European Union at a municipal level and a, and a city state level, and that the, the federation of those city states, which is the EU, was also going to engage in OSPO as a way of getting the citizenry and all of the people involved to understand the potential of open source for municipalities. All right, so that's the basic timeline that I'm gonna talk through. Now, I already said that we started the first OSPO at Sun. Let me say a little bit more about why that was important to us. At the dawn of open source, there were still a fair number of people trying to define what that meant. The free software folks wanted a complete graft of what they had to say, including the political manifesto that came with that back in that era. Um, but there were other people who thought that they could do a better job. One of them was Bill Joy, who was the chief scientist of Sun, and of course founded the BSD project while he was a grad student at Cal and therefore wrote the BSD license, right? So he had cred credentials. Um, he believed that the that open source as originally conceived was not gonna work very well in corporate settings. There had been a commitment made, not by Bill Joy, to open source Java. In thinking through how he could do that or how that could be done in a way that wouldn't cede control because corporations were all about control back then, um, they came up with a blade and spoke model license called uh, the Scuzzle or Sun Community Source License. It was not an open source license. It did not pass the OSD. They tried to make a Hail Mary play to say, look, we love you little open source initiative, but we have longer experience and we think it should happen this other way. And that was unsuccessful, thankfully. I was actually hired to defend the Scuzzle and I only did it for six months before I was convinced by the community that this was the wrong way to go about it. And I became a true believer. And this is something that happens over and over again in corporations where people become OSPO spokespeople. They, they um, often drink the Kool-Aid and whatever the corporate agenda is over the history of uh, OSPOs, whatever the corporate agenda is, it starts to morph in the person of that person. So that happened to me. And um, I actually quit Sun because I was tired of being told that we weren't doing things right and I couldn't seem to influence them to change it. But at the time, they were interested in keeping me at Sun uh, more than they were interested in being right about that. And so they offered me an opportunity to open an, an OSPO, an open source program office, in order to create a more authentic open source at Sun and help educate people and hopefully change minds of leaders like Bill Joy. So that's why we did it. Um, so now we're going to talk about the age of the Paleolithic OSPO. <laughs> These are the big moves in prehistory. Uh, and this is a piece of Paleolithic art off a uh, uh, cave face in uh, France, famously. So this is the beginning of prehistory. First time humans do something that we can date. Um, OSPOs at this time were mostly about legal encumberment and um, attention to detail that for-profit software not get sucked into <clears throat> what was seen as a problematic licensing model in the copyleft licenses. 
Now, for the record, I don't think that copyleft is problematic. I think that there are some really good reasons to use copyleft. I, I am a member of the Apache Software Foundation as well, and I also have a deep belief in the right times and reasons to use permissive licensing. In the Paleolithic period, most of the OSPOs were run by lawyers, including the Sun OSPO. Although I was running it, I had an assigned lawyer whose job was to keep me on the straight and narrow. And um, we did exhaustive readings of the license text and tried to understand it through the lens of corporate licensing and corporate contract law. Um, and we grouped them into ones we were willing to deal with and ones we weren't willing to deal with. One of those was the GPL. Um, there was a blanket statement made that Sun would never touch GPL licensing. And then only a year later, we licensed the um, open office project under the LGPL. So we were blowing through our own edicts pretty quickly. This was really, really common. There was a lot of vanity licensing happening where companies were putting their names on licenses and then throwing code over the wall. Apple did a famous one of these when they switched to the mock kernel. They, um, they created the Darwin project. They hired some of the best engineers in the BSD community to run it. And then they proceeded to undermine that community by tossing tarballs of each successive build of the actual operating system over the wall and, and you know blowing up whatever the community was doing over and over again until everybody left. That took about a year. So in the Paleolithic time, most OSPOs were pretty broken. Then came the Mesolithic period of OSPOs. And this was a transition period. This, this coincides with the large growth, that 10 year period of growth for OSPOs that I, between 2000 and 2010, we sort of you know slid into the Mesolithic. Um, it became pretty clear that a vanity license was a bad idea because it didn't create interoperable code. It didn't promote code reuse. Um, even some of the best you know, intentions like the Mozilla Project's original license, instead of creating an Olympic sized pool of code that could be reused, it basically created infinite kiddie pools of code. And that's because of the way the license was written. It wasn't interoperable between versions. And so the Apple public license, which was an exact copy of the Mozilla public license made a separate pool of code. I hope you can understand what I'm saying there. Um, there was some progress made, some notable progress made. Um, starting with, I think, the Open Office Project at Sun, we started to show that open source could both satisfy a corporate greed while also satisfying a human need. So uh, the Open Source Project, known as Open Office, was built to hurt Microsoft, full stop. Uh, that is what Sun cared about. That's why they spent the money. People like me that were helping conceive of this project and pushing it forward and designing it were looking for also a rise of the boats around people being able to use productivity software without learning a new language. Because Microsoft is only supporting 13 languages worldwide. Part of our strategy was to make sure that people could localize OpenOffice into their own needed language. And we had at one point 160 separate efforts to try to do that. Wikipedia, similarly, you know, is about giving you the some of the world knowledge in your own language. And um, it, the truth is that Sun didn't care about that in your own language thing, except to the extent that it was pushing their agenda of scaring the pants off of Microsoft by you know, getting substantial market share away from them in a short period of time. At 1.600 million copies of um, OpenOffice were downloaded every time we turned a version. So we were pretty successful at that. Um, another really fine example of an OSPO that was serving a corporation, but doing it creatively was uh, Google Summer of Code, where Summer of Code both helped Google in a material way, but Google was not giving away the secrets of their search, search engine, even though they were using GPL licensed code, they were using the loophole that they weren't distributing that code, they were just performing it on their website. So they weren't legally required to give those changes back, but they were sort of aware that they had a moral obligation. And they got interested in ways to make the open source community better directly through the efforts of their OSPO. And thinking about how to grow the, the 
pool of open source developers that were available, they thought, wow, there's all those students that in CS departments. What if we made a cash prize for them to come and be involved in open source over their summer? And they, um, you know, we would pay them, we would make some minimum requirements of what, you know, positive involvement looks like. Oh, and by the way, since we're fast tracking them, we probably need the projects to agree so that it's not a big, you know, clusterfuck for them. So let's include the projects in the planning, get them to agree to mentor a certain number of students, place the students with the projects, and then, you know, do some analysis of how well they do. This also allowed, in addition to helping them with their open source reputation, it allowed them to preview some of the best up and coming open source ready engineers that were about to graduate from school. So it was also a recruiting thing for them. Um, so, you know, this is basically a way to say to you, an OSPO doesn't only have to protect the corporation. But you also heard me say in the Mesolithic period, uh, there was a fundamental shift in the architecture of software towards software as a service. So in the Paleolithic period, we were still shipping, shrink wrapping CDs, DVDs, floppy disks of software, and people were going to Fry's and buying it off of a shelf and taking it home and putting it in their computer. But by the Mesolithic period, I think there started to be easier ways to get software distributed. And some of them were not distributed at all, like the Linux use that Google did, they were performant. And because the licenses were not written to um, touch that performant issue, with the exception at this point of the Afero GPL or AGPL, that all the other licenses didn't close that gap. And so even the GPL, even the copyleft licenses were fundamentally permissive as long as you were just performing. So if you were shipping it in a car, in a vehicle that you were building, like a lot of the automakers did, then you were in violation of the GPL. And the Free Software Foundation continues to track down people who violate the GPL and try to get them to understand what that distribution trigger looks like. But um, they've been slow to close that that permissive, um, I'm sorry, that performance loop. And that allowed a lot of new companies to set up OSPOs, make sure they stayed on the right side of that loop, but also realize that they still had to give back in some material way to stay on the right side morally of the open source community. Okay. The third big wave of OSPOs is the Neolithic OSPO. <laughs> that is the sort of almost uh, recorded history <laughs> OSPO. And um, this, by the way, is off of Newgrange and Ireland in the country I live in now. And uh, I would say that, that the difference between Mesolithic and Neolithic is that now open source has won and we're starting to see companies like Microsoft revisit the activities of their OSPO. OSPOs are starting to show up everywhere in the industry at this point. And um, even outside of the industry, starting to see some OSPOs. So early, early adoption OSPOs, both in academia and in cities, happened much earlier. But we're starting to see them become more effective as we get into the Neolithic period. We're seeing um, because open source has won. There's an there's a reexamination uh, by the by a new crop of businesses that want to take advantage of the halo effect of open source without actually dealing with all of the requirements. And OSPOs are key to help educate people about, you know, why that's wrong thinking, what, what direction to go. It also provides a single point of contact to a burgeoning open source developer pool for a company that's trying to stay on top of things. And I think we're in the Neolithic period in the tech industry still, and we're gonna be in it for a while, I think. But the real reason that we're doing this talk is to signal a modern era of OSPOs. Yes, that is Burning Man. Notice it looks a little Neolithic. Um, because what we have now is an interest that in, in a couple of sectors that have never really shown deep interest before, um, in academia and also in municipalities, we're starting to see a real interest in using open source, but they're not organized like traditional tech companies who've been able to mobilize engineering resources and to build business models that include open source as part of their story. 
um, a lot of the reasons that these new players are wanting to get into it is because there's a lower cost of acquisition or perceived lower cost of acquisition. So all of that rhetoric that was very common in the Neolithic era, or the cathedral and the bazaar, is still being read by these new players and they're continuing to kind of misunderstand what that means. They have some challenges, which we'll talk about in a minute, in order to make this all work. But we're suggesting, and I'll tell you who we are in a minute, that we should be creating a network of OSPOs for this type of customer. And the truth is tech OSPOs have been networked. A lot of us have hopped around between OSPOs. Stormy Peters has got the, the definitely got the um, prize for the most number of name brand OSPOs ever worked in, right? Starting with HP and now she's at Microsoft and she was at three others in between. Um, but all of us hop around. I mean, I hopped around and my last OSPO job was only over two years ago working for um, PayPal trying to get theirs together. Uh, lots of us have engaged in consulting in between our, our big gigs. So we've done a lot of small holder helping as well. But getting OSPOs to work and open source to work at scale in municipalities and um, academia is going to require some different tools and different ideas and different changes. There have been efforts to get open source to work at civic um, level before. Famously, there was um, the Code for America, which you know it was a really great effort. Uh, they learned a lot. They uh, eventually had to retrench because their original idea of open source for the masses was sort of not working, partly because they were having a hard time with requirements and expectations. Um, there were a lot of reasons. But um, likewise, uh, there, it, it's exhausting work running an OSPO and people do, you know, time out and need to go re recharge, right? Um, and another reason that it's going to be different is most of these entities don't actually have their own programmers who are persistent. Open source kind of depends on a certain amount of persistence of at least the key players. That's why we built at places like Apache, the you know growing of responsibility as you distinguish yourself because it makes it sticky for those people. Um, but both municipalities and academia have like four years at best <laughs> of of a workforce, and then it shifts. You know, and then they tend to get very young workers. Not not exclusively. There definitely are municipalities with large. Uh, engineering organizations, but they also tend to use a lot of body shops, and that is a really ephemeral workforce. And so figuring out how to shift the attitudes and teach people how to do this in a different way is, is going to be a lot of the work of the OSPO++. So open source for public good, definitely not a new thing. It's been a lot of us, even though enlightened self-interest is such a key part of open source, trying to be good they're trying to do good while doing well has been a thing the whole time, starting with open office in 2000, Mozilla in 1999, they were trying to, or 98, they were trying to save their company, Mozilla, but they were also trying to do a good thing. Apologies for the phone, sorry. I'm in a hotel room. Um, but uh, they, to get it to actually work, open source for public good that works is a different thing because you need that institutionality. You need to be able to convince suits, money, lawyers, others, that this is a sustainable thing that you're doing, that it's not just fly by night. It's not fringy people who don't fit into society. Now, as open source has won and moved into the mainstream and more people get paid to do open source than do it for free, um, this is changing. And again, OSPO++, the idea of that is to expand on the idea of open source for public good and actually make it work this time. So one of the big things that they're having to relearn uh, as we talk about this network effect is the idea that all boats rise. Why do all boats rise? Because that's how open source works. There are no fences. Interestingly, in the world of open source, we're seeing a lot of emotional response in the newest crop of, of leaders to um, what they perceive first as a sustainability effort, but um, the fact that maintainers are tired and you know, 20 years of doing something will make anybody tired, um, how to fix that problem, looking at the money trail and then thinking, oh my gosh, uh, 
we have to write licenses that that cause people um, through legal means to or moral means to contribute commensurate with the value that they're deriving from the thing that's being written and maintained, not by their employees, right? Um, so that's selective boats thinking. Um, you know, if you're if you're doing it for free, then you get a pass. But if you have money, then you need to, you know, give us some. Um, we we decided a long time ago that open source wouldn't work that way. All the boats have to rise, and how this manifests in academia and in um, municipalities is some of the boats want to see some other boats not rise. Like every time I've ever spoken about open source in a municipal government, and I've been doing this for twenty two years now they eventually ask me how they can lock out their competitor country to the north, south, east, or west that they don't trust, right, um, for whatever reason. And we always have to say that's not how it works. <laughs> so this is, a, this is a big pill for you to swallow if you've been competing for resources all of your life. Figuring out how to share is harder, right? And um, get it, letting even some of the poorer countries get the benefit of the fact that you're paying for stuff. Now, I worked on the COVID tracing app that is now called COVID Green App over at Linux Foundation. I worked for them on that for the Irish government. We had a paying customer, the Irish government. I spent most of my time on that project advocating for a broader vision and for them to spend a little more money to build something that could be more broadly used around the world for good reasons. And that has worked out, but it's the first time that the Irish government's ever actually engaged in that kind of altruism. And they're altruistic people, <laughs> but it's a hard thing to think of if you have accountants running a matrix of cost versus benefit, because it seems like an intangible benefit. So this is one of the biggest challenges that I think the OSPO's, OSPO++ network will face but the point of making it a network is finding articulation of intangible values um, faster and in a more compelling way so that people don't get stuck on the penny counting, right? So we, who I referred to earlier, is a little consortium of people. We call ourselves MossLabs.io. And this background here is um, from the website, MossLabs.io, and it is uh, pointers to documentation about a series of events or things that Moss Labs has engaged in over the last um, two years. And what's interesting is during this time is exactly when Europe was analyzing the idea of open source as applied to a federal government and how you would choose um, how to set that up. The Obama administration was also deeply into open source. I didn't tell that story, but I'm happy to And somebody asks in, in the questions. Um, this is worth going to look at, and it's definitely worth getting involved in if you represent either academia or a municipal government. Um, there's a lot of opportunity to right now, a lot of interest from some very deep pockets, but they're not traditional deep pockets. Like we're doing this because we're a tech company and we wanna get on this wave. This is more like we have problems to solve and this looks like a better way than the way we've been trying to do it. But they need a lot of help to understand and they need a lot of help to figure out how to fit in within the boundaries of what open source means without once again trying to redefine it. All right, so that is the end of my talk. I have 10 minutes for questions, I think. Um, join me on Friday if you thought this was interesting for a different talk, Lessons Learned from Building Intersource Commons. That's a really short 15 minute talk, but it's part of a block of Intersource stuff. And if you haven't looked at Intersource, but you've had to try to explain to a company how to do open source and it's been too hard, you wanna see this because this will help you understand how to apply inner source methods inside first, um, behind, a, behind the firewall to get everybody ready for the idea of how to collaborate. I think this is the most important sustainability thing that we could be doing. So I hope you'll join me for that. And in the meantime, thank you very much. And now I will turn my, my slides off, hopefully, <laughs> so that we can go back to talking. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for that, Denise. That was a great talk, um, a really nice way to kick off the day. Um, I have a question um, from the great. audience. Um, someone asks, uh, in your experience, 
what is it that usually triggers an organization to take that first step and set up an OSPO? Usually, in my experience, it is still concern from the legal community or the policy community or the compliance community about getting it wrong or the brand, sometimes the branding people. Um, and that's not a bad impetus as long as they don't get stuck there, right? You do need to understand what the working um, tolerances are and, and before you can do something innovative like the summer code, right? You need to figure out what the, what the rules are. Um, but I wish that people setting up OSPAs would think more about it that way. Like now that I understand the rules, how far can I go in the direction I want to go? Rather than um, just, you know going through years of slogging through the rules and being pretty boring, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, okay, um, we have time for another question. So if anyone wants to write one, um, now's your chance. Boy, I must not have been controversial enough if that's, if that's what it would be. <laughs> I mean, you have time. You know, you're giving another couple of talks, so I'm sure if people um, want to ask you questions, they have time to, to do that as well. Yeah, um, we get a lot of questions over at Moss Labs about why we called it Plus Plus. Okay. Um, the first plus is about in expanding it past code to data, hardware, all the open. Mm -hmm. And second plus is that network effect, trying to get the cities to start sharing information instead of somehow seeing it as a competitive advantage as those cities need to compete against each other. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, maybe they do, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's probably not to the, to the advantage of their citizenry, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. so yeah. The idea here is some of the larger municipalities like the city of Paris, are mm -hmm. building open source tools that are actually pretty valuable, but mm -hmm. uh, everybody else isn't jumping on the bandwagon of learning how to use them. Now, mm -hmm. I know more about the situation in the US in terms of sizes of things. So I'll say that there are something like 35,000 municipalities in the US that are too small to have their own programmers. Mm -hmm. So one of the things Moss Labs has been thinking about is how to um, increase their access with turnkey solutions but we have to work out you know who would run them who would manage them all that stuff right mm -hmm. and um another another interesting thing is uh, the largest research institutions worldwide already share a fair amount but they also all have technology transfer offices that try to patent things um to to preserve value within that university so that they can get licensing fees Mm -hmm. but it's not working. And what it really effectively does is people abandon whatever they worked on for their PhD project and mm -hmm. go invent it over in the technical world, you know, commercial world, because they can't access that information that from what they did before without mm -hmm. paying a fee that they can't afford. So if you look at the really successful um, hallmarks of the internet era, you know, you see things like the World Wide Web well, Tim Berners-Lee decided not to patent that idea so that it would grow. Mm -hmm. It's like the ultimate in permissive licensing. So what we're seeing now are really serious research institutions like Johns Hopkins setting up an OSPO. First of all, Johns Hopkins set up an OSPO last year. It's kind of amazing, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. uh, they put it in the library because it's the mm -hmm. one place that everybody touches. This year, they're doing something called Semesters of Code. Semesters of Code is an embroidery on Summer of Code. It's the idea that you could, for your own students, help them to the experience of working in this way. And you'd get more of them involved if you weren't paying money, you know, getting through the, the hoops that you have to get through in order to get on the gravy train of, of the Google Summer of Code. What if you, A, took projects that were being written in your university anyway, open source them, B, get your own students involved, get them a fast track to getting involved in those projects. And then C, hopefully help them springboard from that experience into the commercial world in a way that connects to that experience. The first institution we know that did this exactly this was University of California in Santa Cruz. Mm -hmm. They have an amazing program that is just this, right? They, they had a grad student who was already, frankly, a known quantity out in Silicon Valley, but he came mm -hmm. back to do a PhD. 
he took what he did and turned it into a company. The project is called SEP, C-E-P-H. He took what he did, he turned it into a company, he made a lot of money. The university got back to him and said, hey, you're an alumni and we helped you to this experience. Why don't you give us some of your money? And he said, <laughs> I would be happy to do that if you made it possible for other students to do what I did. So they built a whole program just about reproducing that experience. Great. That is something that can be reproduced around the world of academia. Mm -hmm. And similarly, again, the city of Paris for their own needs wrote a soup to nuts. Here's a package that runs a major city. I and mean, it's Paris, it's a big city, right? Mm -hmm. 217 separate services that every city pretty much needs. Mm -hmm. I need a marriage license. How do I go get one? I have a pothole in my street. How do I get that? You know, right? Mm -hmm. And then some very creative ones, like um, um, they put a certain proportion of their budget aside uh, mm -hmm. for public commentary um, in what they call participatory budgeting, mm -hmm. right? So the citizens realize that they are the government. How much would that? How much would that shift things if people got back to realizing that they are the government instead of mm -hmm. thinking about the government endlessly? Yeah. And um, helping municipalities to figure out how to do some of these things. This all fits in the rubric of OSPO plus plus. That's why we got mm -hmm. interested. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much for that.